We start with a montage thing where a bunch of doppelganger clones hang around Jen's apartment. Whilst the Asian guy from last week's wedding takes her out on a bunch of dates and seems way too good to be true. And turns out I'm totally right, because this fella has only gone and done a smashing dash and now totally ghosted her after munching a green casserole all night. So she goes to her office and spends the whole day wondering if this fella is ever going to text her back. Whilst her mate Nikki is surprised that she's nominated for Female Lawyer of the Year, putting a strange emphasis on the word female, like she hasn't been sure if Jen's actually a boy or girl all this time. Anyway, she's asked to go up to Emil Blonsky's house on a Sunday morning and act as personal protection for the parole officer, who reckons that that Tim Rothfeller has totally gone and become a giant veiny monstrosity when they said he totally shouldn't. After singing one note of Hansen's mmbop, because reasons, they arrive at his gaff, where it turns out his ankle monitor got fried when he was out rescuing a chicken from an electrified fence. So the parole officer, who's irrationally scared of a Russian bloke what speaks with a British accent because reasons and who can turn into a giant monster and eat him whenever he wants, speeds off in his car, whilst Emil hilariously wonders why he's always in a hurry to leave. Bruh. Suddenly, though, a Spanish matador is flung onto the bonnet of Jen's Prius, whilst Piers Morgan charges at her. Oh, uh, oh wait, no. Sorry, I meant a butt ugly stinky pig man. LOL! So anyway... She-Hulk puts the smack down on this pig fella and turns out they're just working out their anger issues. Because this Spanish swashbuckler, who's apparently totally not a matador, represents everyone who's ever tried to murder the poor scene abomination, what looks like Piers Morgan at a 4am wake up call. Anyway, she can't go home now, given her car's front is more wrecked than Katie Price's chassis. Bruh. So Blonsky tries to get her to put her phone down and take a rest in his yurt at the back of his garden. Which sounds dodgy, but is disappointingly all above board. After wandering the grounds trying to find a phone signal to see if that Asian guy who did a premature evacuation the other night has texted her back, she interrupts a struggle session between the aforementioned Spanish matador and his Morgany boyfriend, a budget blade who's convinced he's a vampire yet seems to be sitting in sunlight, and some real life furry who refuses to take off his alien face porcupine costume. Naturally, Jen doesn't want to associate with these bunch of nutters and so she sits in the corner still working on getting a signal. Whilst the guy who is literally dressed in a porcupine costume and is too anxious to take off his mask reckons Piers Morgan and his Spanish mate are spending an amount of time together that is totally unhealthy. And before you can say, I didn't know porcupines were raging homophobes, suddenly that bloke what tried to beat up Jen with a magic light stick a few eppies back walks into the room. And we know it's him because Jen breaks the fourth wall again and tells the unseen producers to throw up a previously on segment to remind us all. Shame she couldn't tell them to make the writers pull their fingers out their buttholes and write a decent show, but whatevs. So she immediately hulks out and throws the human male with no superpowers across the room in a fit of anger. Even though she spent most of episode 1 telling the actual Hulk how she was totally in control of her anger because as a woman she's had to deal with dicks every day of her life. Or something like that. Huh. That couldn't have just been feminist platitudes written by a team of agenda pushing millennial women who had no self-awareness nor intent to follow through on such characterisation, could it? I mean, that's what the show told us but we keep seeing something else entirely. I don't know. Screw thinking and shit. I'm just having too much fun watching Piers Morgan and his Spanish mate have such a strong bromance that the actual abomination has to make them swap seats like naughty schoolboys, because they won't stop disrupting the session with their top bands. Anyway, the once bad guy who tried to beat up the She-Hulk a few episodes ago apologises for trying to do all them bad things, and says he's totally a changed man, and then tries to get Jen to open up on feeling so conflicted about being able to turn into a giant gorgeous Amazonian woman with an athletic body and huge nooks whenever she wants. Man, first world problems, eh? But thinking about it, she does have a point in this monologue, because she reveals that some of her recent dates preferred her in her She-Hulk form and don't stick around when she reverts to Jen, and then almost all of them go on to turn up in court to defend her against copyright suits and proceed to roast her and call her butters to her face. Oh, bloody men. But she thinks this Asian guy was one of the only blokes she's met since her accident that seems to love Jen for Jen. And so it hurts that he hasn't messaged her back since he totally tooted and booted. And after releasing all this pent up emotion, the group applaud her for detransitioning to the form of a normal woman. Even though she can totally do that with ease anytime she wants and has done multiple times before. Including at the start of this very epi. 
Inspired by our stunning and brave epiphanies, the weird alien porcupine bloke feels ready to literally lower his mask. And the camera pushes in with climactic music like it's going to be some earth shattering cameo reveal. Like maybe Matt Murdock finally making an appearance. But turns out it's just some beardy rando and they all say he smells. Then she finally takes a meal up on his offer to chill in his year. And her new friends give her a goodbye card as the supposed vampire guy totally loafs around in the glow of the midday sun. Which doesn't bode well for the upcoming Blade reboot and the canonical lore of vampirism in the MCU. Hopefully he's just a loser familiar wannabe. Like the police guy in the OG film. Or Ezra Miller. Anyway, Jen hitches a ride on a tow truck home and we flash back to what really happened three nights earlier. As the Asian guy what just loves Jen for Jen wakes up in the middle of the night and makes his phone shag her phone. Or Zamshi. And we end with an Asian spy stealing an American's data. And before you can say, what a way to shove in some politics, he takes a pic of her sleeping and sends it to that lab from the end of last week's epi. As we finally cut to black with still no sign of that horny Netflix guy. And that's it. That's episode 7. Though my favourite part was when Jen told Piers Morgan, aka Manball, that his mechanical ball joke felt very forced. And all I could think was, well he'll fit right in on this show then. LOL! Anyway, on to episode 8. We start with two dudes stealing a giant fuck off TV from a clearly closed shop. Though why anyone would still commit crime in a universe literally crawling with superheroes both galactic and street level, I don't know. I mean, the MCU should be a crime-free paradise right about now. Anyway, then a budget green Power Ranger appears who apparently calls himself Leapfrog, even though he can't leap for shit, before getting beaten up by two of the wimpiest thugs I've ever seen in a superhero show, and so activates his jetpack boots so he can run away like a right cuck. Unfortunately, the boot boosters cut out and his feet are soon on fire, like when you forget your flip-flops and have to walk on even the shadiest part of the sand to get to the beach bar whilst on your holidays in Egypt. Anyway, so he goes to the She-Hulk to try suing the manufacturer over his third degree burns. And after barely asking any further questions, she totally reckons he has a case. But unfortunately, the client they need to sue is totally her super suit designer. And before you can say, well, that's clearly the biggest conflict of interest since it was revealed that the head of Pfizer is also on the board of Reuters fact-checking service. Her boss says, nah, it'll be fine. As Leapfrog's dad is one of their biggest clients. So just sign a conflict waiver and go take down the guy what literally dresses you. Naturally, she don't want to take down Luke because that's where she gets her sweet clobber from. But reluctantly, she does so. And as you can imagine, Luke ain't best pleased to find out his client is suing him and also being represented by a second client of his. Man. For a super secret operation, his clients sure do seem to have a lot of random connections to one another. So even though she reiterates that no lawsuit has yet been filed, Luke is offended by the mere accusation that his work could ever be considered faulty and refuses to make another dress for her ever again. In court, Jen reckons she's totally going to win this case because Luke seems to have turned up without counsel. Until he confirms that he does have counsel, but his lawyer is just late. And it turns out to be none other than that horny bloke what likes to cosplay as a budget devil and thinks every day is Halloween or some shit. So Matt Murdock immediately begins showing her up as Jen then turns to camera and asks, who's this asshole?" Like she apparently never paid attention to one of the biggest trials of the century where the bloke standing opposite her represented one of the biggest mass killers in New York history. <laughs> Unless his previous show's history isn't canon, Huh, who knows? But I'm just more baffled by the fact that this woman can apparently break the fourth wall but has somehow never seen the Daredevil show over on the Netflix. What are the rules here? Anyway, Matt hilariously wins the case in under three minutes. And all because she didn't seem to even ask the basic question of what type of fuel her client used in his super boots before taking on the case. And getting all the way into court before an actual judge. What kind of shameless incompetent lawyer is this broad? Oh yeah, that kind. Later that evening, Matt visits Jen in the bar, and before she can say, how the F did you know I was sitting here when you're supposed to be blind, he buys her a drink as she moans about him making her and her client look like right mogadons, and unironically asks how he even knew to ask about the fuel type, and instead of simply saying he went to lawyer school, passed all his exams and just asked the basic questions necessary to assess whether a case has any merit or would have any credibility in front of a judge, 
He says it was just a hunch. Then they do a bit of flirting before he gets up to leave. And even Charlie Cox can't get through the line, it was nice meeting you, without laughing at the disingenuousness of it all. Jen then gets a text from her old client from a few episodes back and goes off to meet Todd Phelps, aka that cringy rich white soy boy from the speed dating scenes in episode 4, who kept wanting to know if she was indestructible and shit, who now tries to impress her at dinner by boasting about how he bought a Wakandian spear for a million buckaroos at a recent auction. But now they totally want it back, because they don't really want their shit bought up by a rich white guy even though he paid up fair and square through a legitimate process. Then he tries to lay it on her, so like a sane person, she squishes the table into his nuts and storms off. But before she can crash out on her sofa for the night, she gets yet another call, this time from the client she just totally lost the case for, saying he needs help because there's some mad nutter clinging to the top of his roof. When she gets there though, it's totally that daredevil fella, dressed up in a brand spanking new suit, as they proceed to smack each other up like the world's most erotic bout of foreplay. Once she exposes his secret identity and they both get up to speed, they go over to the leapfrog dude's lair, as apparently he's only gone and kidnapped Luke the Drip Broker, because this froggy fresh dude just can't accept the judgement of the courts and clearly hates democracy. On the roof, Jen and Double D are casing the joint and trying to figure out the best approach to enter the lair. Naturally, Daredevil wants to go in stealthily, all Splinter Cell style, but Jen wants to smash her way in through the walls like a real life Kool-Aid man, only more green and with boobs. They then have a discussion on what constitutes a goon and how that differs from a henchman. And spoilers, one believes in the cause, like a terrorist, whilst others are just mercs for money. Kind of like modern day doctors. Anyway, she reckons it's a little far-fetched that you can work out how many bad guys are in a room via the sound of their heartbeats alone. Despite her being able to turn into a giant green fuck-off troll monster whenever she wants and also existing in the same universe as a talking tree. So Daredevil goes in quiet and even gets himself a budget hallway fight scene. Although, disappointingly, it's not shot in one take. And after he's done beating everyone into a PG-13 bloody pulp, a guard screams, we need backup at the rear entrance. And before they can respond with, are you talking about Preparation H? She-Hulk smashes up the gaff whilst Leapfrog leaps to safety. And then into an ambulance because he totally breaks his ankles jumping out a three-story window without superpowers and with already third-degree scorched legs. Luke reluctantly acknowledges that they're totally even now she saved his life and will make her dresses again as long as she refrains from becoming too bloated. And so after fat shaming a giant green monster to her fucking face, he walks off without being squished like a bug on a trucker's windscreen before Jen goes straight back to her flat for a bit of hanky-panky with that horny fella with a horny helmet. <laughs> what? It's an accurate statement. But disappointingly, we don't hear her cry, Hulk smash, at the moment of climax. The next morning, she wakes up grinning from ear to ear, whilst Disney presents the most cucked version of Daredevil ever seen by showing him actually doing the Walk of Shame, in a show that they totally insist is not in any way a superhero parody program made by Jason Friedberg and Aaron Seltzer. Then Nikki comes in with her new suit for the gala that evening, and the writers hang a lantern on their own inept writing ability by making Jen question why this scene even exists, and channels most of the audience's feelings by just wanting the episode to be over already herself. So that night in the gala, Jen totally wins Female Lawyer of the Year, along with five other winners. And after the Asian one practically calls herself stunning and brave in an unironic way, Jen loses her shit after a secret clip of her bonking the Asian dude last epi gets projected up on the screen behind for all to see, and then gets arrested as she almost crushes the windpipe of a random guy when she loses her rag and totally hogs out. And here I was thinking that she totally had control of her temper like she promised Bruce back in episode 1. And that's it. That's episode 8. Although, there's still a few things I'm curious about. Like, did Matt have to use his echolocation ability to find the correct hole to penetrate? And if so, did he have to do it by spanking her ass a few times to get the juices and frequencies flowing? And why did Leapfrog think rib it and rip it was the best catchphrase anyone could come up with? Surely leap for the sky would have been less cringy. Bruh. But I digress. Now on to the finale. We start with me thanking God that it's the last time I ever have to do this shit for this show. Before they go about spoofing the OG 70s show, leading to poor Bill Bixby doing fucking carousels in his grave. Hilariously though, the ironic physical parody version they do here is unironically better than the CGI monstrosity they actually use for the main show. 
God, who knew a bloke in a wig and green paint would be 10 times better and less ugly than whatever an overworked and underpaid VFX team could produce in the limited time of the production schedule? Oh, that's right. Literally everyone. Anyway, it turns out this was just a dream. Oh, I think. Because Jen wakes up in a cell. She wants to prosecute everyone what embarrassed her by filming her shag that Asian dude. Because she's a giant racialist and don't want anyone to know that she does interracial stuff. Or something like that. She's also a bit pissed off about all the hacking into her private phone messages and shit. But her lawyer colleague reckons she was baited and she totally took said bait by losing her shit and smashing up the gala at the end of the last epi. So now everyone thinks she's an out of control hulk with extreme PMD. You know, maybe she should talk to that collateral bird out of Amazon's Lord of the Rings show as I hear she suffers with the same problem. So she gets fitted with an ankle monitor which never seems to come up again and upon release from jail her parents hug her and say don't worry darling because people go to prison every day. With more cope than Elizabeth Banks defending the absolute box office bomb that was Charlie's Angels a few years ago. So because she's now seen as toxic, unstable and bitter aka your current day feminist Jen's totally unemployable and so she has to move back in with her folks after losing her job, reputation and home. Nikki then tries to work with her to identify the leader of the Intelligentsia Network who seems to be behind it all. Until her mum walks in and shows her her old college videos featuring the cringiest attempt at dancing since Theresa May tried to move her creaky joints in front of a bunch of Africans and then Theresa May again walking out to Dancing Queen at the 2017 Tory party conference. Oh, I tell you what, I can't wait to see this bird on Strictly Come Dancing in a few years. Later, Jen collapses on her bed in a fit of depression until she turns the camera and asks us what we want to see. But before I can say you off my fucking TV screen or even a consistently written and interesting narrative, she packs up her shit and heads off to Emil's private retreat place. Elsewhere, her best friend Nikki totally betrays her before the common good. Because as Karl Marx and every communist ever always believed, the ends totally justifies the means. And so she uploads that cringy vid of her mate twerking and doing slut drops to bait the mysterious Hulk King from out of the shadows. And the guy who runs a website what can't even spell intelligentsia or anonymous properly proceeds to invite her to a special internet troll incel meetup group. Naturally, because she has a fanny and there are exactly zero incel women on the planet <laughs> well Greta Thunberg accepted of course Nikki can't go in herself and so ropes in that pug fella to infiltrate intelligentsia. And as you can imagine, he's feeling a bit awkward about trying to blend in with a bunch of hateful bigots. Which is pretty rich given this show regularly goes out of its way to mock the genre's fan base and paint YouTube critics as some kind of terrorist group. And yes, I believe that is supposed to be a depiction of Doomcock up on the screen who's totally doxxed her and is now leaking all her private details and shit. But anyway. Once inside, the show presents an example of toxic fans by making a bloke give valid criticisms in a calm and measured way whilst further bemoaning how you can't make jokes anymore. And I can totally relate. I got yeeted off Twitter a few years back when I said the newly announced Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings sounded like some sort of Asian porno. Bruh. <clears throat> anyway, after introducing himself to the group by actually saying, females am I right? Park is immediately welcomed by Todd Phelps, aka that guy who Jen speed dated in episode 4 and whose testicles she squashed flatter than Prince Elrond's face against a giant table in the last epi. And in a shocking twist, what the audience could never see coming. Turns out Todd Phelps is actually the Hulk King and he was the one what hacked Jen's phone and made her look both a right skank and a violent nutter the other night at the gala. He calmly argues that superpowers should be awarded meritocratically and not just by random chance, fate or straight up nepotism. Which is why he hates the She-Hulk so much and is totally jealous and bitter about it all. Suddenly though, he brings out the once fearsome abomination but makes him look more cucked than that time Arnold Schwarzenegger told us to get jabbed and Screw your freedom. Despite now being a geriatric pensioner who sold out to the establishment. Apparently, this abomo bloke has gone all Jordan Peterson and is there to do a motivational speech about life coaching. It's actually pretty inspiring to be fair. Until he's stopped in his tracks by flabbergasted Jen, who just can't believe the guy who spent weeks trying to murder her own cousin has now gone all far right by trying to help a bunch of incels become better people and feel more confident and happy in themselves. But before you can say, hang on, 
How does his shirt still fit his human-sized body so perfectly when it was just stretched to the limit in his monster form? Nicking that pug fella burst in, bringing her up to speed about Todd and shit. Hilariously, Jen is totally surprised that that bloke she spurned and then practically castrated with a restaurant table is the one what's been ruining her life and stitching her up like a kipper. And Todd totally admits to getting that Asian guy to seduce her and steal her blood so he can get all her powers without having to be run over first. Or something like that. Anyway, he injects some super steroids into his bloodstream, which totally ain't nothing at all to do with that super soldier serum from those other Marvel properties, and soon becomes a literal gym bro, only with less obnoxiousness. He then literally tells them to come at me bro, before that titania bird randomly smashes through the wall again, because reasons. Before Jim bro Phelps laughably orders his human goon to go get Jen off the actual abomination, and predictably ends up getting smacked harder than the Chris Brown floozy. Bruh. Then out of nowhere, Bruce Banner, aka the OG Hulk, walks in and somehow legit looks like the smallest guy in the room. Wowzers! Way to totally nerf a legacy character, Marvel! Before long, though, the show gets so convoluted and messy that even the producers throw their hands up in the air and just cut to the Disney Plus home screen. And the still image is unironically more entertaining than anything that has happened during the past nine weeks. Then Jen smashes through the thumbnail of a Marvel behind the scenes documentary also because reasons, before storming through the back lot with the jankiest walking animation since anything in that god awful food fight movie. She eventually ends up face to face with the actual writing team who have literally and narcissistically self inserted themselves into the episode, which reveals an actual writing session full of diverse millennial woke tards whereby one can finally begin to understand just how this show turned into a worse fucking train wreck than Amazon's Rings of Power. And maybe even that Witcher spin-off, which somehow featured a deaf elf despite having giant fuck-off ears, and a magical mage who couldn't even fix her own wonky legs. And instead of smacking each one of these writers upside the head one by one for what they've put her and us through over the course of the past two months, she demands to speak to the manager. Achoo, I mean an exec producer called Kevin. So she marches over to his office, but first has to talk to the dweebiest dweeb receptionist I've seen since that Tom fella of celebs go dating. And because she's a super brilliant lawyer, she immediately signs an NDA despite not taking any time at all to study what the heck she's agreeing to. Which incidentally is exactly how I ended up with 300 alpacas when I thought I was signing simple divorce papers. Now I have to somehow deal with my ex's llama addiction. Fuck's sake Brandy. Anyway, she then smashes her way into the exec's chamber, where she's met by a robot automaton wearing what looks like a baseball cap. But turns out this ain't the actual Kevin Feige fella, but actually an artificially intelligent piss tape bot. Where it's revealed that Kevin is an acronym that stands for Knowledge Enhanced Visual Interconnectivity Nexus. And not like I thought for the past four years, crappy executive vexes internet nerds. <coughs> anyway, this K.E.V.I.N. fella sounds like that talking chewing gum nonce from Sausage Party a few years ago. I am Stormatol, Malatol, Xylatol, His name's Gum. And in turn, that lazy specky stargazing chap would love to sit down all the time. Then they spoof the conspiracy theory in an internet joke that Marvel is in fact now just an assembly line churning out formulated factory produced content for easy consumption of next product. What? The bot then boasts that he has the most advanced entertainment algorithm in the world and produces near perfect products. And we can tell that he's totally wrong because he's instantly disproved by being on the very She-Hulk show that it has apparently made. Though Jen doesn't want her story to end with said formulaic climactic fight sequences, as her narrative has smaller interpersonal stakes and the finale should respect that. Because anything else would apparently distract from the story of her life falling apart just when she was learning how to be She-Hulk. Even though she straight up told Bruce in episode 1 that she has the whole Hulk thing under control and then proved it by beating him at a bunch of sports. So after going even more meta, she makes him change the ending and laughably says that she has ideas for season 2, which is about as likely as Marvel ever making a good product again to be fair. And after moaning about not getting the X-Men yet and then boasting about literally nailing Daredevil, she confronts a now arrested Todd Phelps and totally defeats the patriarchy by slinging a lawsuit in the face of an uber rich white guy. Daredevil then gets there too late to do whatever it was he was going to do, because comedy bro and breaks the cardinal sin of gritty superhero lore by showing us his super suit in broad daylight, where of course it looks super fucking lame. Then she makes him all agree to sign an official letter, resulting in him going back to prison for 10 more years for violating parole, 
After going all far right fascist and trying to help some blokes better themselves and become more suitable mates for the female dating scene. Though he's totally fine with it apparently because he's now gone all new agey and shit. And she throws back a soggy remark and thinks she can be more sarcastic than a sarcastic plot recap video. See? I could do full full breaks too, goddammit. <clears throat> anyway, unfortunately, that daredevil bloke wasn't late enough to evade Titanium randomly appearing and taking his picture, nor tardy enough to avoid Jen's family barbecue. And poor Matt has to endure worse softball questioning than Joe Biden at a CNN hosted Q&A session. Then Bruce randomly appears and says he's totally got a son now because reasons. Apparently his name is Scar. And unfortunately, because we're at the end of the season, the poor VFX team clearly ran out of time and money to animate the front part of his hair. Bruh. And we end on some quick expo dump as a reporter informs us that Jen has been conveniently cleared off screen of her recent conviction. Which I presume was for smashing up that gala thing. And just as I get excited about finally getting to see one heck of a courtroom showdown on a legal show between the title character and the villain what almost ruined her entire life, she simply makes a public threat live on TV. And so the show ends with a stunning and brave She-Hulk warning about how she's totally going to be the judge, jury and executioner for anyone she deems to be quote, harassing or attacking innocent people. Oh, much like a real life Reddit mod I guess. And before you can say, surely that can't be it. The show drops a random post credit scene where Wong lets him meal out of his cell to come watch TV in Kamataj. Because literally reasons were also never explained. Speaking of things that were never explained now we're at the end of the show, I still don't know why Titania has super strength for what she was all about. I mean, I think she was supposed to be the main baddie, but was she ever even bloody defeated? Last thing I remember, she totally took herself out of the wedding when she slipped on some ice and smashed out all her teeth, and leaving her looking like a Jeremy Kyle love rat. Then she turns up at the end of the finale, taking a picture of Daredevil because... reasons. And this is what apparently passes for professional writing on this show. It's also seemingly never explained why Jen can randomly break the fourth wall, even though Bruce can't and it's never been previously established as part of a Hulk's power set in the MCU. I mean it at least makes sense for someone like Deadpool, given he's a psychotic parody character and over the top piss take of Slade Wilson, but this show presents Jen as a relatively grounded character in a relatively grounded world. So why she can randomly see me through the camera eating Jaffa cakes off my moobs and not think she's going totally insane and freaking out 24-7, I don't know. Anyway, thank fuck that's over. I give up trying to make sense out of any of this shite. So ultimately, that's the plot. I mean, what little there was of it. And that's your lot. Considering in that bell thing so you don't miss any future recaps. Tell me if I'm right. And this show is more half-assed than the magician's assistant after a botched sawing trick. Or if I'm being a right ignorant bell end in the comments if you have time. And I'll see you in the next one.